Anyway, it's a real pleasure to be here today with you guys. It's really an honor. It's just an awesome, um, it's a really awesome sort of audience. So um, I'm just going to get straight into it. You know, when I started working on technology, I did this because I thought that technology could actually resolve and answer many of the challenges that we're facing in youth mental health. For example, we know that the majority of young people don't access the mental health care they need. We go, well, no problem, technology is everywhere. You know, even when young people get access to treatment and they get better, we can only provide time-limited support. And we know that up to 80% of young people with depression or with psychosis, for example, are gonna experience relapses from the mental health conditions. You say, well, technology is permanent. It's unrestricted, no dramas. Um, unfortunately, our treatments are not very engaging, and we know that a lot of young people are going to disengage from treatment too soon. So, well, if we know something about technology, is that it's very, very compelling. And finally, our interventions are not great at dealing with some key issues for young people, such as reducing loneliness or bringing about social connectedness. Well, social media should be able to do something about that, right? So technology is here to help, isn't it? And to most likely bring about the next revolution in youth mental health. Well, is it? So let's have a look at what's happening here. On the one hand, we've got the commercial social media sites such as Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and others. And of course, their aim is to be commercially viable. And to do that, they need to grow as much as possible. On the other hand, we've got online mental health interventions. We don't even have a cool logo. And, <laughs> but these are developed mostly by universities and by governments and NGOs. But we've got a good aim. We want to improve the mental health of young people. We want to improve lives. But who do you think is winning here? Let's have a look at some of the stats. You know, young people check their mobile phones 157 times a day. 50% of young people go into Facebook first thing in the morning, right after they wake up. 60% of Facebook and Instagram users use these platforms on a daily basis. And the percentage of daily Facebook users actually goes up by 17% every year. The Snapchat has just as many teens as Facebook does, despite being a lot smaller in size. And young people use the Snapchat 17 times a day. This is remarkable, isn't it? What about our interventions? What's going on here? Well, our interventions are associated with high attrition rates. And this is despite having a short-term focus. Um, despite significant investments on the part of governments and universities, still e-health still represents a very small proportion of mental health care delivery. And this is important. Young people consistently tell us that online intervention should be an enhancement. It should not be a replacement of youth mental health services. So what's happening here? I was thinking, are we really that bad at developing products that young people want? Are these guys creating lovable technologies while our interventions are simply boring? You know, are these guys really, really smart and we're just simply not so smart? That's why we're not working in Silicon Valley? Or are these guys developing addictive platforms where our interventions are simply too hard work for young people? So let's have a look at how these companies work. You know, the business model, a measure of success of companies such as Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and others is a time on screen. In other words, to capture as much of your attention as they can. For example, YouTube recently celebrated one billion hours of YouTube videos being watched every day. And because of the attention economy, because of the model of advertising, the more of your attention they get, the more money they make. So they've got this unbounded appetite for attention. The problem, of course, is that the more of your attention I get, the less someone else is going to get. So over the past few years, we've experienced this arms race for attention. What Tristan Harris, an ex-Google ethicist, calls a race to the bottom, where the lower someone goes to get you to click and stay, the lower someone else has to go. 
And to win at this race, these companies, make no mistake, have literally a thousand engineers on the other side of the screen whose job is to get you to click one more time. And these engineers use a whole playbook of persuasive techniques and technologies that really tap into the back doors of our minds, into our social and cognitive biases to keep us glued to the screen. For example, we're all very vulnerable to social approval. This is one of the highest human motivations. We all want to be accepted. Uh, we're also very attracted to variable, unpredictable rewards, such as the one used by slot machines. So when we cannot quite predict when we're going to get a reward, that's very highly addictive. So now, Facebook knows that when you post a profile picture, right at that time, you're highly vulnerable to social approval. So they can actually orchestrate when you're getting likes and comments, when they show it to your friends. So you keep on getting that sort of reinforcement at random times over a prolonged period of time, and each time getting you right back online because you're getting a notification. What else? We're also very vulnerable to social reciprocity. So if I say thank you, you have to say you're welcome, particularly in Australia, you are very nice. Um, but also, if I share you a drink, then you owe me a drink next time. My, my, my origin friends are really good at this one as well. Um, but now, the tech companies are actually uh, exploiting how often we experience this. And the biggest offender here is Snapchat. In fact, this called, they've got this new feature called Snap Strikes. And the Snap Strikes counts the number of days in a row that I've been chatting back and forth with a friend. So for example, if I've got a best friend, I've been talking to that friend for 100 days in a row, then I see like a little fireball and the number 100 next to it. And what this does is that now I've got this thing that I don't really want to lose because I've got 100 days. If I don't talk to you tomorrow, I'm going to lose the whole thing. And this has pretty detrimental effects and impacts on young people. Uh, for example, Emily Weston from Harvard found that a lot of young people wake up in the morning and they start taking random pictures of the floor and ceiling just to make sure that they keep all their strikes going. So what else? I want to talk to you about the newsfeed as well because this is very important as well and very interesting. So what is the role of the newsfeed on Facebook? Well, in theory, it's to give you the content that matters to you the most. And in some ways it is. But what you might not know is that back in 2016, Facebook actually fired the whole trending team. And this team was in charge of deciding what kind of content should appear on top of the newsfeed, the trending content. And they were replaced by an artificial intelligence algorithm. And this algorithm, of course, is programmed to maximize time on the screen, to maximize the number of clicks. Um, interestingly, the day after this algorithm was introduced, the most popular news were actually a fake story about Megan Fox and also a link about a man masturbating with a McDonald's sandwich. So, <laughs> go figure. Um, but as it happens, you know, fake news and outraging stuff get us to click us a lot. Even if that means that thanks to Facebook, our day becomes like a day filled with outrage. Yeah. So, yeah. So, this is pretty depressing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So what can we do? And I was going to say before, actually, what are the consequences of, of an online environment where maximizing the number of clicks is all that matters? You know, in fact, there's actually a lot of research showing that social media can have positive consequences. It can improve self-esteem. It can improve life satisfaction and well-being. It can provide opportunities for socialization in times of crisis. It can also foster self-expression and leadership, which is all fantastic. However, in a what I call Wild West online environment where the number of clicks is the currency of success, there's also a lot of negative consequences. Like, for example, cyberbullying is highly frequent. It's often suffering in silence and is associated with depression, not surprisingly. In a large UK survey, two out of three young people said that Facebook actually made cyberbullying 
worse. And as many as one in five young people uh, said that they actually go online just to make sure that their friends are not saying mean things about them. Unfortunately, the quest for attention on part of the tech companies is actually leading to an externalization of self-worth. So the number of followers, the number of likes and comments that you're getting has become the most direct indication of how valuable you are. And so many young people will spend hours curating and improving the profile pictures just to attract the maximum number of likes and comments. And this is creating a fake parallel um, reality where once again the, the rich becomes richer and the poor becomes poorer, where the most vulnerable people are the most likely to pay the price. In fact, seven in 10 young people say that using Instagram actually makes them feel worse about their body image. And 50% say that using Instagram and Facebook actually increases the sense of anxiety. And we know that lurking online, just going online and checking out other profiles actually increases your sense of social isolation. Pretty dramatic gain. So we thought, uh, before I go into that, I actually have a quote here from a very interesting study. This is the Bean 13 study conducted by CNN where a young woman said that she would take on average 100 pictures, sometimes 150 or even 200, just to take the perfect selfie. So in this environment, we thought, well, can we actually create a space where lovable technology meets interventions that actually improve and change lives? And these companies are showing us that not only we can engage young people and users, we can also shape behavior. So we thought, can we reverse engineer the whole playbook or persuasive techniques used by these companies to actually persuade young people to do something that is objectively good for them. And here's some examples on how we're trying to do that. For example, we're using online social networks and not only just to keep young people online, but to create safe, empowering, meaningful social networks built on the principles of compassion and self-acceptance. We're using sophisticated newsfeed algorithms in our interventions, not just to maximize well-being, not just to maximize attention, but to maximize well-being. We're also creating fun, easy to digest therapeutic content that is compelling and engaging for young people. I'll come back to that in a minute. We're using natural language processing, in this case to provide young people with good choices, but also to protect them in case they're becoming unwell, or they're gonna about to experience a relapse, not just uh, to use, uh, to, you know, to promote some sort of targeted advertising. And finally, and this is quite important, we wanna uh, make young people fully aware of the relationship between what they do online and offline and how they feel, as opposed to hidden design choices that are designed to steer your attention towards things that might not be necessarily good for you. And one of the ways we've done this is by creating the constantly evolving most model. And most is stands for moderated online social therapy, fully integrates and enriched social media platforms that has social, online social networking, expert moderation, peer moderation, new models of psychotherapy, such as strength-based models, mindfulness, self-compassion, and metacognitive therapy. And it's designed to both engage young people, but also to improve well-being. And most has been applied to interventions for young people with psychosis, young people with depression, young people at risk of developing psychosis, with social anxiety, at risk of young people at risk of committing suicide, but also for relatives of young people with psychosis, depression, and so on. Um, and as I said before, we've made every effort to make therapy as compelling as we can. And one of the ways we've done this is by creating online comics. And we've done this in collaboration with professional writers, <laughs> leading comic developers, young people, and clinical psychologists. So let me show you what this looks like, actually. So here, I'm actually picking content on worrying. And that specific comic is a comic on deep breathing, on mindful breathing. So we've incorporated in the comics animations to make, in this case, the experience of mindful breathing compelling and easy by breathing along the movement of the moon. 
We've got many, many different comics, but when you finish a comic, you can actually provide feedback on how that made you feel. And that feedback is used alongside your preferences and needs to actually give you more choices on things that might be good for your well-being. Let me show you another example. In this case, it's about using natural language processing, that evil technology, for a good thing, you know. So on Facebook, if you post any concerns about your body image, even if it's in a private message, before you know it, you will start receiving some sort of targeted advertising about diet, for example, which is not very helpful. So we're actually using this technology to provide young people with real-time choices, analyzing the content of the post in real time, and giving them things that they can do to deal with that emotional state in a positive way. You can see an example right there of the newsfeed. And based on the content of the post, you receive different kinds of, of suggestions. So also in line with young people's consistent feedback that online intervention should never replace face-to-face -face interventions, that they should enhance face-to-face -face services, we created a hybrid model of care that we call eOrigin.most. And eOrigin.most fully integrates online and face-to-face -face care. So it fully integrates a full array of online support, including 24-7 online social networking, professional moderation, expert moderation, online therapy, and real-time therapy provided by therapists through real-time chat or video conferencing, but also real-time assessments through mobile technology that are collected passively and actively, I'll come back to that in a second, all of which is gonna fit into clinical management, which is really gonna change the way clinicians work, but more importantly, the way therapy is perceived and experienced by young people. We think of this as an enhanced model of care or therapy on steroids. So, let's see what I can. And finally, um, as I said before, for us, it is a total priority to make young people fully aware of the relationship between what they do, online and offline, and how they feel. But we don't wanna keep on asking people questions about how they feel every time they do something, because it's boring. So uh, one of the ways we're doing this is by using digital phenotyping or passive sensing. So for example, we can provide young people with real-time feedback on the relationship between how they feel, which we can work out through analyzing the keyboard activity, for example, or through random facial recognition, and what they do online and offline, which we can passively collect through mobile technology. Um, we think that this is a key pillar of an ethical and transparent way of using technology. So, in conclusion, technology can indeed bring the next revolution, bring about the next revolution in youth mental health. It can really reinvent youth mental health services. It can transform the way we work. It can actually empower young people and clinicians. But let's make no mistake, at the moment, it's not quite doing that. So I think let's bring on together the well-being economy. Let's drive the revolution from within and work hand in hand with young people to fulfill this promise. Thank you very much. Thank you.